Previously, we discussed a series of heresies that are important for the history of Christianity. Other than the Inquisition and the Protestant Reformation, the most important heresy would be Catharism, also known as the Albigensian movement. They were vegetarian, mostly pacifist, deliberately impoverished. They taught that the material world was the creation of an evil god. The god of the Old Testament and that this world was a deliberate mistake. Celibate, because you don't want to enslave more souls to the god of evil, and in their view, that god of the Old Testament was Satan. We'll see how their viewpoint was not so unusual as it might seem. Last time we also discussed the major controversies that shaped Christian dogma in the late classical age at the fall of the Roman Empire. The most brilliant men of the Roman world would gather for conferences. But these men were not gathering to discuss ways to prevent Attila the Hun from burning entire cities off the map. They were not using their genius to work out strategies to prevent the barbarian vandal hordes from cutting off grain shipments to Rome as they carved out a kingdom in North Africa. No. None of that was really important in these times. As civilization disintegrated, the first order of business from the new Emperor Marcian was to decide whether Jesus was a spirit from heaven in a fleshly body, or whether Jesus had both a human and divine nature at the same time. Because theology was worth killing for back then. The angels dancing on the head of a pin are laughing. But let's go deeper, to the most formative years as we plumb the depths of the evidence we do have for a skeptical perspective on Christian origins. The year is 380. Let's suppose for a moment that you are a traveler in the eastern city of Constantinople, seat of a major bishopric with real power over the lives of its citizens. But you've had a long journey. Suppose you decide to get a bite to eat to refresh yourself. You head to a bakery. How much for the hot cross buns, you might ask? Jesus is a created being and is subordinate to the Father, the baker might reply. You're confused, and it's not an isolated case. Religious talk is everywhere. Suppose you finally get your hot cross bun, and you decide to check out some of the city's famous bathhouses. So, what time are you guys open? You might ask the attendant. In response, the attendant insists that Jesus' existence preceded the natural world as an uncreated being. But all you want to know is whether they're open on Sundays. Instead, you get an earful on how powerful Jesus is, and when or whether he was created. This is the situation described by St. Gregory of Nyssa upon his visit within that decade. And he was appalled by the casual confidence with which ordinary people were throwing themselves into weighty theological debate on the origin, powers, nature, and providence of Jesus Christ. Every part of the city is filled with such talk, the alleys, the crossroads, the squares, the avenues. It comes from those who sell clothes, money changers, grocers. If you ask what the exchange rate is, he will reply with a dissertation on the begotten and unbegotten, St. Gregory Groust. Indeed, church and state were wedded at the hip, and violence was rampant. In the 4th and 5th centuries, the descriptions of these ancient clerics does entail a rather different character than the descriptions of the pampered pontiffs that so enraged Martin Luther a millennia later, or the modern disgust at the Bishop of Bling 
During the formative years of the proto-Catholic religion, the monks and bishops that attended the major religious conferences that determined modern Christian beliefs had a definite hunger. And not that they went on hunger strikes, yet a few did. But the attitudes reflected by the most committed clerics became remarkably similar in outward form to the Cathars discussed in the previous session. In order to be credible in the contentious religious conferences, far more important than whatever city was being burned off the map by rampaging barbarians, a bishop monk had to adapt a rigorous regimen in order to achieve true holiness. Some did indeed adopt an attitude to eat only the minimum food needed to sustain their lives. Sex was out of the question. Comfortable bedding was considered vanity, an obstruction to true spirituality. To picture some of these great conferences, remember that most of them took place in the East, cities in Asia Minor near latitudes where it was not uncommon for summer temperatures to reach the 80s or 90s on a Fahrenheit scale. Hundreds of angry, contentious, celibate men upbraiding each other in the stifling heat of enclosed chambers 1,500 years away from air conditioning. And with these circumstances in mind, did I mention that bathing was also considered a vanity? Picture that for a moment. The perfumed Roman world, once flowing with cleansing aqueducts and luxurious high culture, was fast becoming unrecognizable under the new religious regime. This attitude continued after the fall of the empire. The monk Severus, upon attaining the see of Antioch in 512, was noted to have dismissed the cooks from the Episcopal kitchens, vowing to subsist on the cheapest vilest bread he could buy in the markets. His destruction of all bathing facilities in the Episcopal residence was lauded by contemporaries with the same enthusiasm as stories of Old Testament kings of Israel tearing down pagan idols. Personal hygiene was akin to paganism. But these godly men would have no qualms using violence if necessary to achieve religious objectives. If you truly believe that the correct Jesus recipe will get the creator of the cosmos to grant perfect success and security in this life and the next, then there are a few extremes that could not be justified under these circumstances. <laughs> Rituals taken for granted today become a matter of life and death in those days. As Bishop Stephanos of Cyprus discovered, the importance of the Council of Chalcedon hammered out as the Western Empire burned, was enough that the regional church patriarch dispatched soldiers and an angry gang of monks with orders to beat Bishop Stephanos until he vomited blood or consented to taking communion. In the way mandated by the Council of Chalcedon, it was necessary to beat him into unconsciousness and drench him with buckets of water until he consented. According to R. Payne Smith in Ecclesiastical History of John, the Bishop of Ephesus. And that's just the way theology was conducted in those days. I recall a modern story that encapsulates some of this fanaticism. In the middle of this past March, there was a report from Afghanistan about a 27 year old woman named Farkunda who was beaten to death with sticks and set on fire by a raging mob under the false accusation that she'd burned a Koran. Just the allegation alone was worth a death sentence from mob justice. When we hear stories like this from the Islamic world, it might be tempting to believe that it's just that religion, that Islam promotes savagery. But there have been times in history where Christians have been no different. In the 3rd and 4th centuries, religious disagreements over the varying Jesus recipes typically resulted in either joining or raising an angry mob to rampage through the city and slaughter the guilty party, unless met by soldiers or another angry mob. <laughs> <laughs> 
and that just became part of routine politicking among competing clerics trying to impose their personal Jesuses on the empire to argue, argue wrangle, use parliamentary maneuvers, mutual excommunication, and mob violence as regular parts of the religious toolkit. Troops badly needed on the bleeding frontiers of the collapsing empire had to be called in to quell urban chaos when a pro-Chalcedonian bishop was elected in Egypt to literally force communion bread into the mouths of the reluctant and to murder the occasional Roman pope who made eastern enemies after the western empire became too weak to protest. While most priests in this age attempted to outrighteous each other through physical privation, the power wielded by the bishops and patriarchs proved a siren song to those willing to rise to power on the backs of those beneath them. Emperor Marcian had to address allegations that Bishop Dioscorus of Alexandria was diverting grain shipments to feed starving Libyans and selling the proceeds that he might keep his Episcopal palace fully stocked with prostitutes and personal assassins in the megalomaniacal manner of a Bronze Age god-king, as the empire burns around them all. This is according to allegations reported by Price and Gaddis in the Acts of the Council of Chalcedon, chapter 2, verse 55. But few went to such extremes as this. For most late classical clerics, personal hygiene might be off-limits, but murder was not, as Alexandria discovered. For some time I've been of the opinion that if I ever have a daughter, I will give her the middle name of Hypatia. The woman was an astronomer, mathematician, professor, and power player in an age where equality of the sexes was a remote fantasy. She communicated with the most notable intellectuals of the late 4th and 5th centuries, and during her lectures and parties all the wealthiest chariots from around town could be seen parked at her mansion. She worked at the legendary library of Alexandria, taught astronomy, philosophy, and appears to have held to a form of pagan mystery religion, which she taught only to a select few. She held to a form of philosophy described as Neoplatonism. Remember that term, it will become important later on. And it appears that at least one of her students was madly in love with her. The man's name was Cyril, and he was not that student. Cyril attained the position of Bishop of Alexandria after the death of his predecessor. He was an advocate of the dual nature Jesus recipe that would win the orthodoxy wars in the West. He was well suited to these doctrine wars, as well as struggles of a more physical nature. Theologically brilliant, but characterized as a bully. He was dedicated to extending church power over civil government, but his attempts to erode any lingering separation between church and state was opposed by the new imperial prefect, Orestes, who was joined in opposition by the famed female philosopher Hypatia. She was rumored to be celibate, but certainty from our sources is difficult. But Cyril was cunning in his attack first spreading rumors that the famed philosopher was, of course, a witch, and that her pact with Satan allowed her to cast a spell on Orestes, because obviously only magic from the devil would make anyone think that it was a bad idea for these literally unwashed fanatical clerics to have unrestricted civil power over the lives and affairs of their followers, obviously. Who was this woman? Not even a Christian. Cyril might have snarled to himself. Not Christian, but the last luminary holdout of an ancient ethical philosophical tradition evolved out of the Hellenistic traditional polytheism. Remember the word Platonism. Not a Christian heresy, but we can follow the thread of this philosophy to an astonishing insight about the early church. Hypatia herself was not a heretic, never having been a Christian at all, 
but there's no evidence that she ever spoke out against it in any doctrinal sense. But any interference in Cyril's vision of church ascendancy justified what happened next. We don't have compelling proof that Cyril actually ordered her death, but most historians that study the matter arrive at that conclusion. Her chariot ambushed, crazed Christian monks tearing into her with pot shards, clubs, and whatever was lying around. While her gruesome death was not the final end for the Library of Alexandria, there is a sense in reading the adaptations of her story that with her end, the Dark Ages are beginning. But Hypatia's belief system, her Neoplatonist cosmology, will be important later. Remember that term. This philosophical tradition will come back to haunt us. So theology was worth killing for. Nothing was off limits. But not all of us are satisfied with ordering our entire lives based on contradictory claims of presumed authorities. The spirit of investigative curiosity moved people like Hypatia in order to achieve a deeper quest for understanding. Is there a way for us, so far removed from those days, to get at the actual facts of these matters that late classical priests committed violence for. There is a great deal that we can learn. As we go deeper, we can assemble manuscript evidence to address these blood-drenched questions of the past. So how to make sense of the earliest days of the church? We've seen a litany of fanatical furor in these attempts to assemble a savior that would well together the empire, guarantee salvation, and perfectly secure God's favor. The Jesus millions worship today is dependent on parliamentary tactics and selective mob violence to build a consensus over time. None of these theologies are based on anything like evidence. But how much evidence is there? How much can we piece together at this late date concerning the earliest origins of the faith? In many cases, there are gaping holes in the historic record by design. But these holes tell us a great deal by their absence. But there are other writings to fill in the missing pieces. The combination of the testimonies we have and what we don't have allows a radical picture of the beginning. So let's go deeper and further back. All Christians are familiar with the epistles of the Apostle Paul, but fewer are familiar with the epistles of Ignatius, written perhaps 50 to 60 years later. One of the first alleged church fathers, willing and able to die for his beliefs, Ignatius writes letters to unfamiliar congregations, to the Tralians and Magnesians, or the Smyrnians, and the tale he tells them is a strange one. And also seems historically implausible. In the days of repression, in the remote times of the early 2nd century, Christianity was a fringe cult movement to be stamped out if possible, yet not a serious concern to the powers of Rome. For the illegal association of Christianity, the story claims that Ignatius was being conveyed under armed guard over hundreds of miles from Antioch to Rome, where he was scheduled to be executed by being devoured by wild animals. He told his friends not to lament his gruesome fate, because, of course, being torn to shreds by savage predators was just his way of emulating his lord. Some critics are suspicious of the story. Why would it be necessary to drag Ignatius hundreds of miles just to kill him, when weapons or savage beasts could be attained anywhere? Moreover, if this preacher were kept under armed guard, that raises the question of how he was able to get letters into the hands of other Christians along the way, who should also have been guilty and merited a death sentence. Forgery, it may be. But the letters were preserved, and a part of certain ancient traditions. Ignatius is what we may consider proto-Orthodox, and he has harsh words to say against the heretics of his day, 
stop your ears when anyone speaks to you without the Jesus Christ who was descended from David, who was from Mary, who really was born and ate and drank, and really was persecuted under Pontius Pilate, and truly was crucified and died, as seen by those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He was also truly raised from the dead. Ignatius is adamant on this point. From arguing so stridently, emphasizing that Jesus really was born and died, it requires that there be Christians who denied much of this narrative. To these seeming Christians, he has nothing but scorn, referring to them as mad dogs and beasts in the form of men. Here we have what appears to be the other side of the coin in the late classical struggles over Jesus' internal nature. Early Christians first had to figure out his physical composition. So here we have the problem of docetism. It appears Ignatius is arguing primarily against Christians who doubted that the founder of their religion was a real man with a real body. Jesus as a heavenly phantasm. How common is it for members of a sect to believe their recent historic founder might not have had a real body? Interesting question. Well worth considering. Also interesting is the nature of Ignatius' rebuttal. It's not that he has inherited some apostolic tradition from the earliest days, and that these heretics can be laughed off. No. He asserts that Christians must believe in a human Jesus simply because his faith is in vain otherwise. Uh, but he cites no human testimony, no inherited apostolic succession, just the deep need to believe in a literal human savior of divine providence for emotional, personal reasons. That's all. The Gospel of Ignatius is nothing like ours, even though clearly he's been influenced by something like our Gospel writings. This represents a structural similarity in most surviving 1st and early 2nd century Christian writings by the Proto-Orthodox. Many contain what might be termed pocket Gospels. As important as what's there is what's missing, as we shall see. Hidden from the prince of this world was the virginity of Mary and her child-bearing, and likewise also the death of the Lord. Three mysteries to be cried aloud, which were wrought in the silence of God. Notice that Mary's delicate condition and the death of the Lord are mysteries, and they are hidden from the prince of this world. This is very unlike any of our Gospels. Yet Ignatius is adamant in his conviction of an earthly Jesus dying under Pontius Pilate. Yet these verses themselves represent a clue to the phylogeny of shifting Christian doctrine in these times. We'll return again to the prince of the world and the hidden mysteries of Jesus. I'll give you a hint. The prince of this world is not the Roman emperor. The rest of Ignatius' pocket gospel chapter relates a dizzying fantasy whereby Jesus transforms into a star so bright that its light was unutterable and its strangeness caused amazement. The rest of the stars form a choir around the Jesus star, perhaps not unlike a cosmic episode of glee. And all magic spells are dissolved, and death was allegedly abolished. Apparently, this event was visible across the entirety of the world and cosmos. Needless to say, such a spectacular apparition would have merited a comment or two from the hundreds of writers working throughout the early first century. For the early Christians, fact and fable were hopelessly intertwined, and belief was a matter of need rather than fact. All this to shore up the early orthodoxy. But Ignatius and his friends have a problem. This is the earliest 2nd century, not the 4th. In those days, Roman paganism held sway. So, it wasn't possible to whip up 
angry mobs to ambush inconvenient people driving their chariots home for the evening. It was impossible to summon troops with orders to force communion wafers down the throats of the unwilling. No, heretics had to be engaged in the arena of ideas. And that brings us to a vitally important book in our study of the history and heresies of the early Christian world. Panarion by Epiphanius. The word translates into medicine chest, and it was the intent of this scholar to provide a collection of theological remedies to the many, many, many heresies populating the Christian world in the first three centuries. Epiphanius was likely to have been very handsome as a young man, for reasons we'll discuss below. Through the Panarion, we know of many of the long defunct heretical sects some alluded to in the first week of the study. Here we take a sampling of a few of the 80 different sects known from the earliest times. I'll describe a few of the most outrageous as evidence for a larger thesis. Most vexing for early church fathers is, of course, Gnosticism, the pursuit of spiritual knowledge as the ultimate currency for salvation. Though the early church fathers were vigorous in their attempts to purge these texts, the treasure trove of the Nag Hammadi library found in 1945 revealed the sect like never before. Epiphanius denounces them as a swarm of insects infecting us with diseases. He rails against a preacher named Nicolaus as the source of his heresy like fruit from a dunghill. But there were many Gnostic mystics over the centuries. Complementing Epiphanius's vitriol with the Nag Hammadi writings, we have a complete enough picture of these strange believers to become even more baffled from knowledge than our prior ignorance. The titles of their works, in my opinion, are the most provocative. There's the Gospel of Mark that we know, then there's the secret Gospel of Mark, permitted only to the deepest initiates in the mystery faith who were apparently instructed to lie, even under oath, in a court of law, to deny the existence of the secret gospels, because normal people just can't handle them. Other titles include The Hypostasis of the Archons, Pistis Sophia, or The Trimorphic Protenoia, which refers to the three-formed first thought of the divine. And there are other obscure gospels from some of the more minor characters in our Bibles, like the Gospel of Mary and Thomas. The Gnostics wrote the Exegesis on the Soul and the Apocryphon of James. And just in 2000, archaeologists were astonished to unearth the long-lost Gospel of Judas. It was a suicide by Roman, just to kind of give you a hint. These books had to be unearthed for the simple reason that the Proto-Orthodox were eager to destroy them wherever they could. Very heretical. However, there are other nuggets of history that can be gleaned not only from these writings, but the details of how they were made, which we will get to near the end of this workshop. Gnostic beliefs, to boil them down into their most distilled essence, would include the idea that there are two gods, one penultimate god of absolute perfection, and an evil god of petty tyranny. The petty, cruel god precipitated a cosmic disaster through his hubris and accidentally created the earth. From this ultimate true god sprang the archons, spirit entities that represent the qualities of the ultimate god and serve as a quasi-pantheon. Sound familiar? Anyone who heard the Cathar lecture should make the link. Some ideas have a long shelf life. What separates Gnostics from Cathars, for the most part, was the Gnostic belief that knowledge itself was the key to salvation. Not what we might term scientific knowledge, because remember that the world is evil, so learning about it won't help you. For the Cathars, asceticism and rejection of worldly interests was the key to salvation, but not for the Gnostics. For them, it was necessary to actively attain salvation as an achievement of spiritual self-actualization. 
The Gnostic ideal is based on a doctrine that there are pure souls representing parts of the true God of goodness, which are now trapped in the world of evil. Similar to the Cathars, some Gnostic sects practiced celibacy. Since we don't want to enslave more souls into the world of the cruel God, instead, the goal is to unlock self-knowledge, which by their theology means nothing short of apotheosis. Here's a proverb from the Gospel of Thomas that sums this up. If you bring forth that which is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Mind-blowing. Apparently, the purpose of these deputies is to be deliberately obscure, to force the initiate into self-reflection based on the attempt to unravel the hidden meaning. In this way, Gnosis is achieved by bringing forth the divine that is within each initiate. They viewed proto-Catholics as mentally stunted dullards stuck at a lowly stage of spiritual growth. The scholar Elaine Pagels quotes Gnostics as describing the Orthodox Christians as waterless canals and dumb animals. The doctrines that so perplexed the Orthodox abounded, because one of the ways Gnostic sages demonstrated their gnosis was by inventing fantastic quasi-gospels on a regular basis. Moreover, if a Gnostic could convince his peers that he had reached the final stage of enlightenment, they considered him or her, freed of the moral constraints and hierarchy of the church. Many were ascetics, but there are allegations that others engaged in lascivious conduct, since they were enlightened and had realized the godhood inside themselves. They were thus released from the constraints placed on the hoi polloi, as it were. Most insidious was the fact that Gnostics blended into the congregations of normal, proto-Orthodox Christians. They thought of themselves as perfected Christians who had transcended the rest of the group. So the bishops had to find them out, correct them, or excommunicate them. And often they defied authority on the basis of their supposed spiritual attainment, and were challenged often by bishops, to which they would reply, you, a mere servant of the Demiurge, have no mastery over us, being spiritual. The proto-Catholic hierarchy was not pleased. So they thought of themselves as part of the Christian congregation, not as some external, heretical counter-church poised to overthrow Christendom. They believed they were simply more advanced. But sometimes they would gather together for their own rituals, inviting only those that had reached a similar phase of supposed enlightenment. But not all Gnostics and Gnostic-influenced sects practiced austerity, and sometimes the lines between different categories of heresy would blur. The church father Epiphanius, who wrote the Panarion, detailing some 80 heretical sects as mentioned above, was probably not that bad looking. This we might infer as a result of his encounter with a truly bizarre, presumably Gnostic-influenced sect known as the Phoebeanites. Two women approached the young cleric, very attractive. They attempted seduction to get him into church. The Phoebeanites have a very, very special liturgy Earlier in this series, we mentioned the group who believed in 365 gods. Well, a young and handsome Epiphanius met two of these believers, and his accounts are scandalous, to say the least. We'll get into more details next time, as we go back to the evidence of the first century. More details about more cults, all building towards a radical thesis. Uh, just to kind of give you a, a hint... Um, the Phoebeanites are the group where it actually might be a good idea to bring the condoms to church. Just a hint. Remember the baker in Constantinople? His heretical pastries 
support the movement known as Arianism. No, not these Arians. This was a heresy holding that Jesus is subordinate, created, and inferior to God. The struggle to defeat this sect lasted centuries. But does it really matter? In an age governed by superstition, it very much does. Our friend the Catholic historian Hilaire Belloc predicted that Arianism would produce a culture focused more on the singular Godhead and more like Islam. What we know with greater certainty is that the struggle against this idea ultimately forced the doctrine of the Trinity in response. The Gnostics themselves forced the proto-church to definitively identify the Creator as the Supreme God. The Nicene Creed is largely a response to these heretics, who define Catholicism, and thus modern Christianity, even as they opposed it. And the diversity becomes truly dizzying. We can talk about Marcion and his two gods heresy, which is largely the very reason the New Testament exists in the first place. Not the emperor. This is Marcion of Sinope, from the second century. Marcion taught that Jesus had no childhood at all, but was a spiritual agent in the likeness of man, who simply descended from the heavens fully formed, as told by a bastardized copy, or an original version, of the Gospel of Luke. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, the Ebionites would have opposed the Marcionites bitterly, for they believed in a Jesus who was entirely natural and simply adopted by God for his righteousness. And they were totally Torah observant, whereas Marcion denigrated and discarded the laws of the Old Testament. To sum it all up, we have Thebanites who worship 365 aeons by way of a sex liturgy in which they lure in attractive young converts. The austere, Torah-observant Ebionites, who believe in an adoptionist heresy whereby Jesus is simply the best Jew who ever lived. But Marcionites hated the Jewish law and its God, believing that the true God of Gnostic goodness sent his unearthly son to pay the price for sin demanded by the cruel God of the Old Testament. And we have the Gnostics, led by Valentinian and Nicolaus and several others, mocking the authority of proto-Catholic bishops as they churn out new, mind-boggling heresies on a daily basis. And there are still others. Many, many more outrageous sects. So many that it leads me to a startling conclusion. That the time-honored story we're all taught to believe in, of a humble carpenter's son from Nazareth, who became a fisher of men, king of the Jews, to rise from the dead is simply not enough. The idea of a single teacher at a single point in history is not sufficient to explain the bewildering menageries of early Christianity. So what does explain it? Next time. Just a dream That's me in the corner That's me in the spot